Tonight, billions of dollars in trade to and from the United States is in jeopardy at one of the world's most important shipping routes, the Panama Canal. The Panama Canal, an amazing shortcut carved through Central America, has been a game changer for global trade for over a century. But this vital waterway is facing a big problem. It is running out of water. Buckle up, because we are about to explore why this is happening and what it could mean for us all. Low water levels because of reduced rainfall have led to limits on the number of vessels allowed through. And 40% of U.S. container traffic. But with water levels below normal, authorities are only allowing 24 ships to cross a day. The birth of the Panama Canal. Traveling by ship from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean used to be a long and dangerous journey. Sailors had to navigate the treacherous waters and strong winds around the tip of South America, either via the Drake Passage or the Strait of Magellan. But a clever solution emerged, the Panama Canal. This amazing feat of engineering is essentially a giant waterway, like a long ditch, carved through the narrow strip of land connecting North and South America. This ditch allows ships to sail between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans in a much shorter amount of time, saving them days, even weeks, of travel. But the story of this amazing shortcut goes back quite a long way. As early as the 1500s, explorers from Spain realized how much easier it would be to travel between the two oceans if there was a canal. They even considered two possible locations, one in Panama and another in Nicaragua. Eventually, they settled on Panama, especially after the United States built a railroad there in the 1800s. Interestingly, the canal ended up being built very close to the same path as the railroad. The first attempt to carve out a canal through the narrow land bridge of Panama began in 1881. Colombia, which controlled the land at the time, gave permission to a French company called the Compagnie Universelle du Canal Interoceanique to build a canal. This company was led by Ferdinand de Lesseps, who had recently achieved great success building a similar canal in Egypt, called the Suez Canal. Inspired by his past accomplishment, de Lesseps set out to build a sea-level canal in Panama, meaning the canal would be at the same level as the oceans on either side. He managed to convince many people, especially ordinary citizens, to invest money Money in this project. However, not everyone agreed with de Lesseps plan. An engineer named Adolphe Godin de Lepinay had actually studied the land in Panama closely and knew that it wouldn't work. He knew the lay of the land. There was a big mountain range called the Continental Divide about 15 kilometers away from the Pacific Ocean, and two rivers, the Chagres River flowing into the Atlantic and the Rio Grande flowing into the Pacific. Both rivers, according to Lepinay, could be used to create artificial lakes. Based on these observations, Lepinay proposed a different plan in 1879. He suggested building dams at two locations, Gatun and Miraflores, to create large lakes. The water from these rivers would fill the lakes, which would be around 25 meters deep. He then proposed digging a channel through the mountains to connect the lakes, and using locks to raise and lower ships between the different water levels to connect them to the oceans. While Lepinay's plan, which eventually became the blueprint for the Panama Canal, established him as a visionary engineer, the French company, unfortunately, ignored his advice. They, unfortunately, embarked on a doomed venture with their initial vision. The French failure in constructing the Panama Canal Ferdinand de Lesseps, the leader of the French company, lacked a crucial understanding of the unique challenges Panama presented. Unlike the dry and predictable environment he encountered during the construction of the Suez Canal, Panama was a whole other beast. It was a humid, disease-ridden jungle, characterized by torrential downpours, scorching heat, and unforgiving terrain that ranged from coastal swamps to the imposing mountains of the Continental Divide. Despite having competent engineers on board, the overall plan lacked a clear direction and crucial adjustments for the specific conditions. The machinery they brought, designed for the desert-like conditions of the Suez project, proved woefully inadequate for the challenging Panamanian landscape. This, coupled with the rampant spread of tropical diseases, which claimed countless lives, ultimately contributed to the project's failure. Despite the immense effort, building the canal proved to be incredibly expensive and agonizingly slow. In an attempt to cut costs, the French company eventually switched from a sea-level canal 
to a cheaper design using locks to change water levels. Unfortunately, this change did little to improve the situation. With no sign of the project ever becoming profitable, the French public began to lose faith in both the canal and its leader. Additional funding attempts failed, and the company ultimately went bankrupt in 1889. Although a small attempt to revive the company was made in 1894, it essentially stopped functioning by 1898. Their dream of completing the Panama Canal was over. The company's only remaining goal became holding itself together long enough to sell the unfinished project. Sadly, the majority of the excavation work done by the French company wouldn't even be used in the later American-built canal. America's endeavor in building the Panama Canal a glimmer of hope emerged in 1902 when the United States Congress passed the Spooner Act. This act gave the go-ahead for the United States to buy the French company's equipment and resources, along with the right to build the canal. However, there was one crucial condition. They had to strike a favorable deal with Colombia, which governed Panama at the time. Unfortunately, negotiations with Colombia stalled. Sensing an opportunity, Panama, with the support of the United States, declared independence from Colombia in November 1903. The United States swiftly recognized Panama's newly claimed independence. Following this, Panama and the United States entered into negotiations of their own. This resulted in the Hay Bunau Varilla Treaty, signed in February 1904. This treaty fulfilled the requirements set out in the Spooner Act and established a special zone, known as the Panama Canal Zone, where the United States would have control over the canal and surrounding areas. With this final hurdle cleared, the stage was finally set for the United States to take on the monumental task of building the Panama Canal. In the summer of 1904, the United States began work on the canal in earnest. They had learned from the French experience and decided to build a canal with locks, which would be cheaper and avoid potential problems caused by differences in sea levels on either side. However, there were still challenges to overcome. One major obstacle was the Chagres River. This river flowed from the mountains in northeastern Panama to the Atlantic Ocean, and its water levels fluctuated dramatically depending on the rain. If a canal was built near the river, uncontrolled floods could easily overwhelm it. In 1906, President Theodore Roosevelt made a key decision. He sided with Chief Engineer John Frank Stevens, who advocated for a canal using locks, similar to the original plan proposed by Lepinay, but rejected by the French company. This plan involved building a massive dam across the Chagres River at Gatun. This dam served two crucial purposes. First, it created Gatun Lake, which was the largest artificial lake in the world at the time. Time. This lake helped control the flow of the Chagres River, even during floods. Second, the lake itself became a significant portion of the canal route, stretching over 20 miles. The construction project was a massive undertaking, requiring a workforce of over 40,000 people at its peak. Most of the workers were laborers from the West Indies, while engineers, administrators, and skilled workers primarily came from the United States. Engineering Against Odds Building the massive canal required powerful tools and equipment. Railroads became crucial for transporting materials and supplies throughout the project. One of the most significant innovations was the use of over 100 steam shovels. These giant excavators played a vital role in digging the Calibra Cut, later renamed Gailard Cut, in honor of David Dubose Gailard, the American engineer who oversaw its construction until his passing in 1913. However, the Calibra Cut proved to be one of the most challenging aspects of the entire project. The unstable soil and rock in the area were prone to frequent landslides and mudslides. It tragically claimed numerous lives during construction. These unpredictable movements of earth and mud made it difficult to predict and plan for, and even the weight of the surrounding hillsides could cause the bottom of the excavation to rise unexpectedly. One particularly notorious event was the Cucaracha Slide of 1907. This persistent landslide continued for years, dumping millions of cubic yards of material into the canal excavation and creating significant setbacks. Despite these challenges, the workers persevered. Often laboring under scorching temperatures exceeding 38 degrees Celsius, they employed various tools like rock drills, dynamite, and the ever-present steam shovels to remove 73 million cubic meters of earth and rock. This relentless effort gradually lowered the excavation floor to within 40 feet of sea level, paving the way for the future canal. Despite the numerous challenges, setbacks, and tragic losses, the Panama Canal finally opened its doors to traffic on August 15, 1914. This momentous occasion marked the culmination of over three decades of relentless effort. 
The Panama Canal to this day remains one of the most remarkable and impactful engineering feats ever undertaken. The Panama Canal's influence on international commerce. Since its construction, the Panama Canal has acted like a pulse gauge for global trade. Just like a doctor uses a pulse to assess a patient's health, the number of ships passing through the canal reflects the overall health of the world economy. When the global economy is booming, the canal sees a surge in traffic, while times of recession lead to a decrease in activity. This trend is evident throughout the canal's history. In 1916, during a period of economic hardship, the canal saw only 806 ships pass through. However, 1970 marked a high point, coinciding with a time of global economic prosperity. In that year, the canal witnessed a record-breaking 15,523 transits. While the total number of ships using the canal has decreased since then, the amount of cargo it carries has actually grown. This is because the average size of ships has increased significantly. In 2000, despite fewer overall transits, the canal still managed to handle nearly 210 million long tons of cargo, demonstrating its continued importance as a major trade route. It's interesting to note that while numerous routes utilize the canal, the most dominant one involves trade between the east coast of the United States and East Asia. This route carries a significant portion of the canal's overall traffic. This route carries a wide range of commodities. Motor vehicles, petroleum products, grains, and coal are just a few examples of the goods that are routinely shipped through this vital waterway. A journey through the Panama Canal. While the Panama Canal offers a shortcut for many ships and boats, navigating it isn't a simple task. Space in the canal is limited, and strict rules govern how ships can use it. Think of it like a busy highway with specific lanes and regulations that everyone must follow. The canal operates on a tight schedule, so ships can't just show up and expect immediate passage. They need to book their time slot in advance. Navigating the canal involves a series of impressive feats of engineering. Ships travel through three sets of locks, aptly named Miraflores, Pedro Miguel, and Gatun, depending on the direction of travel. These incredible structures act like elevators that raise or lower ships in stages to different water levels. If you are traveling from the Atlantic to the Pacific, you will enter the canal through a channel in Lyman Bay, which leads you to the first set of locks, Gatun. Here, your ship will be lifted 85 feet in stages, bringing you to the level of Gatun Lake. This vast artificial lake, formed by dams on the Chagres River, stretches over 166 square miles and plays a crucial role in the canal system. After leaving Gatun Lake, you will cruise through a channel for about 23 miles before reaching Gamboa. This is where the famous Gailard Cut begins, a marvel of human engineering that takes you through the heart of the Continental Divide. Carved through mountains, this eight-mile-long section with an average depth of 43 feet allows ships to effortlessly cross this geographical barrier. As you descend towards the Pacific Ocean, you will reach the Pedro Miguel Locks. These locks gently lower your ship 30 feet to the level of Miraflores Lake. From here, a short sail through a channel leads you to the Miraflores Locks, where another two-stage descent awaits, bringing you down to sea level. Finally, you will navigate the last seven-mile stretch through a dredged channel, leading you into the vast Pacific Ocean. Throughout the entire journey, the canal maintains a minimum width of 500 feet, ensuring safe passage for even the largest vessels. The Panama Canal locks, as mentioned before, are essentially giant water elevators, filled and emptied using gravity-powered water flowing from nearby lakes. The lakes are themselves fed by the Chagres River and other rivers in the area. The locks are all built to the same size and are constructed in pairs, allowing ships to travel through the canal in both directions at the same time. However, operating these massive structures requires a careful touch. Due to the complex machinery involved, only small boats can safely navigate the locks on their own. For larger ships, special electric locomotives come to the rescue. These powerful machines run along tracks on the sides of the locks and use a system of gears to keep the ships centered as they move through. Before entering a lock, a large chain, called a fender chain, is stretched across the entrance. This chain acts like a safety net, ensuring the ship doesn't enter the lock too fast. If the ship is moving at a safe speed, the chain will automatically sink to the bottom of the canal, allowing the ship to pass. However, if the ship is moving too quickly, the chain will hold it back, gently slowing it down until it comes to a complete stop. An additional safety measure exists in the form of a second gate positioned 50 feet behind the first one. In the unlikely event that a ship breaks through the first gate, this second gate acts as a backup 
preventing further damage to the lock and protecting the entire system. The combination of clever engineering and careful operation ensures the smooth and safe passage of ships through the Panama Canal. Water Crisis in the Canal Each journey through the Panama Canal requires a staggering amount of water. About 52 million gallons, this fresh water is used to raise and lower ships as they travel through the different water level sections. The source of this water comes from artificial lakes, primarily Gatun Lake, which rely on rainfall to maintain their levels. However, most of this rainwater eventually flows back into the ocean, creating a unique challenge. Balancing the needs of the canal with the needs of the people is a delicate task. This is because the same water sources that fill the canal also provide drinking water for over half of Panama's population, which is around 4.3 million people. For many years, managing this balance wasn't a major concern. Panama is known for being one of the wettest countries in the world, and historically, the canal and its surrounding lakes have always received ample rainfall. However, in 2023, things took a turn for the worse. A combination of two factors caused a significant drop in water levels, particularly in Gatun Lake. The first was a general decrease in rainfall, creating a deficit compared to usual levels. The second factor was the El Nino weather phenomenon. El Nino, which occurs every few years, is characterized by warmer ocean temperatures that disrupt atmospheric circulation patterns. In the case of Panama and other tropical countries, this disruption weakens or displaces winds that typically bring significant rainfall. As a result of these combined factors, the Panama Canal faced a new challenge, managing its water usage sustainably while ensuring the needs of its people were met. The delicate balance between the needs of the canal and the local population has put a strain on Gatun Lake. The lake is currently facing a daily water deficit of 3 billion liters, meaning it's losing more water than it's gaining. This situation has become so critical that the water level in Gatun Lake has dropped to near its lowest point ever recorded, even during the rainy season. Now, it's time for today's subscriber pick. Imagine waking up one day to the shocking headline, Panama Canal, the world's largest canal has suddenly dried up. This image, while thankfully not real, reflects the potential consequences of this scenario. The Panama Canal is one of the most important shipping routes in the world. It allows ships to travel between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans without having to go around the tip of South America. If the canal were to dry up, it would have a devastating impact on global trade. Shipping costs would skyrocket, and the prices of goods would go up. It could also lead to shortages of essential goods, as some countries rely on the canal to import and export critical supplies. What do you think would be the biggest challenge if the Panama Canal dried up? Let's know your thoughts in the comments section. Deforestation's role in the Panama Canal water crisis. The recent water shortage impacting the Panama Canal has brought to light the complex and interconnected nature of our planet's systems. While the immediate cause of the shortage is a lack of rainfall, scientists point to a surprising culprit contributing to the problem, deforestation in the Amazon rainforest, located thousands of miles away. The Amazon rainforest, despite its distance, plays a crucial role in the water levels of the Panama Canal. Lush rainforests, like the Amazon, act like giant water pumps for the planet. They release vast amounts of water vapor into the atmosphere through a process called transpiration, this water vapor condenses and forms clouds, eventually falling back as rain, creating a self-sustaining cycle. The Amazon, due to its immense size, is often referred to as the planet's air conditioning system, since it influences regional rainfall patterns and even regulates global climate. However, deforestation disrupts this vital cycle. When trees are cut down, they can no longer release water vapor into the atmosphere, leading to a decrease in overall rainfall. As deforestation continues, the rainforest can reach a tipping point where it can no longer produce enough rain to sustain itself, a process known as deforestation-induced collapse. The situation in the Amazon rainforest is even more concerning than initially realized. Not only is deforestation impacting rainfall patterns, but there's growing evidence that parts of the Amazon are actually becoming net emitters of carbon dioxide meaning they release more carbon than they absorb. This alarming trend creates a dangerous domino effect. As the rainforest releases more carbon and experiences less rainfall, the lack of moisture weakens trees, making them more susceptible to death. This further reduces the rainforest's ability to produce rain, creating a vicious cycle. The weakened rainforest contributes to more intense and prolonged droughts, such as the one witnessed in 2023. 
This not only impacts the Amazon itself, but also disrupts local and regional rain cycles, potentially leading to drier climates thousands of miles away, both north and south of the rainforest. The toll of water shortages on Panama Canal traffic. As a result of this water shortage, the Panama Canal Authority, the organization responsible for managing the waterway, has been forced to take a difficult step. They have limited the number of ships allowed to pass through the canal. Under normal circumstances, the canal can handle a steady flow of up to 36 ships navigating its waters every day. However, due to the recent water shortage, the Panama Canal Authority has been forced to significantly reduce traffic, allowing about 20 ships through daily. This unexpected challenge has placed shipping companies in a difficult predicament. They now face a series of tough choices, each with its own drawback. One option is to wait, anchored and potentially accumulating significant costs, until a coveted slot opens up for passage through the canal. This waiting game can stretch on for weeks, causing delays and impacting profitability. For companies willing to pay a hefty price, there's an option to jump the queue by paying a surcharge that can reach up to $4 million. This allows them to move ahead of other waiting vessels, significantly reducing their wait time. However, this option comes at a substantial financial cost, which not all companies are able or willing to bear. Faced with these limitations, many companies have opted to bypass the canal altogether. These ships are choosing to reroute their journeys around South America, navigating either the Cape Horn or the Strait of Magellan. While this option avoids the wait times and potential fees associated with the canal, it comes at a different cost, significantly longer journeys that can take days or even weeks longer. The Panama Canal's water restrictions follow recent attacks on ships traveling through the Red Sea, which is a major trade route. These attacks have already prompted many companies to avoid the Suez Canal. The combined effect of these disruptions is putting immense pressure on global shipping, potentially leading to delays and disruptions in the delivery of goods around the world. This situation further complicates efforts by governments to control inflation, as disruptions to the flow of goods can contribute to price increases. The financial strain isn't the only concern for traders impacted by the water shortage, as the number of ships waiting to enter the canal at both the Atlantic and Pacific entrances continues to grow, so too does the risk of a serious accident. This growing congestion forces ships to wait at anchor for extended periods, often for days on end. These crowded conditions, with multiple vessels in close proximity, significantly increase the risk of collisions, from local solutions to global action. With the recent water shortage and its impact on the Panama Canal, the question naturally arises, how can this vital waterway be saved? While some have suggested pumping seawater into Gatun Lake, the canal's main water source, this solution is not feasible. Gatun Lake is a crucial source of drinking water for Panama, and introducing salt water would have disastrous consequences for the country's water security. Other ideas, like diverting rivers to feed the canal, also raise concerns. While these proposals might address the water shortage, they often come at a high environmental cost. Disrupting existing river flows can have negative consequences for ecosystems and potentially harm indigenous communities who depend on these waterways for their livelihood and cultural practices. Now, simply addressing the Panama Canal water shortage through local solutions might not be enough. Experts warn that a broader approach is needed to tackle the root cause of the problem, climate change, particularly the ongoing deforestation of the Amazon rainforest. As mentioned before, scientific evidence points to climate change, fueled by deforestation in the Amazon, as a major contributor to the water shortage impacting the Panama Canal. While some South American countries with parts of the Amazon rainforest have implemented individual initiatives to reduce deforestation. Greater collaboration is essential. Countries can learn from each other's successful policies and strategies in combating deforestation. Experts also believe the United States, with a vested interest in a functional Panama Canal, should play a more significant role in the fight against Amazon deforestation. Challenges and opportunities in securing the Panama Canal's future. The water shortage has no doubt created a difficult dilemma for Panama's leaders. They must strike a delicate balance between fulfilling the water needs of the Panama Canal and those of the Panamanian people, with over half the population relying on the same water sources that feed the canal. To address this challenge, the canal's governing board recently proposed building a new reservoir on the Indio River. This project aims to increase the water supply and boost traffic through the canal, a vital economic engine for Panama, generating over 6% of the country's GDP. 
According to the plan, the new reservoir could potentially allow for an additional 12 to 15 ships to pass through the canal daily. However, this proposal is not without its complexities. Building the reservoir is estimated to cost nearly $900 million, which is a significant financial undertaking for Panama. The timeline for completion is also uncertain. This is considering the fact that a previous project to expand the canal's locks ran two years behind schedule and faced cost disputes. Also, the construction raises environmental concerns. The potential impact on the surrounding ecosystem, including plant and animal life, water flow and water quality, needs careful assessment. Additionally, the project would involve acquiring protected land and potentially displacing local communities. This raises ethical concerns about ensuring fair compensation and relocation for affected individuals, while minimizing social and economic disruption. Therefore, while the proposed reservoir presents a potential solution, it's crucial to weigh the economic benefits against the potential environmental and social costs. The future of the Panama Canal and the well-being of the Panamanian people hinge on finding a solution that addresses both economic needs and environmental and social responsibility. At the moment, the Panama Canal's future hangs in the balance and the potential consequences of its demise are staggering. Just consider the global shock if news headlines screamed, Panama Canal, the world's largest canal has suddenly dried up. Wouldn't that be a terrifying reality? Global trade could grind to a halt, with product shortages and price hikes becoming the new normal. Panama's economy, heavily reliant on the canal, could take a major hit, potentially triggering a domino effect on other countries. And let's not forget the potential for regional instability, with economic and social disruptions causing headaches for governments and citizens alike. It's a reminder that we're all connected, and global challenges like climate change and environmental degradation can have serious consequences if left unchecked. This is why we need to work together to find solutions before it's too late, not just for the sake of this awe-inspiring feat of engineering, but for the well-being of our planet and everyone on it. Thank you for watching this video. See you in the next one.